Hello everybody. Well, I'm excited to share today's message with you. I'm going to open in prayer and then we're going to get to it. So I hope uh, you're as excited as I am. Um, I'm probably too excited, aren't I? (laughs) So let me open in prayer and let's get into today's message. Father, I thank you for your goodness and I thank you for everything that you did for us on the cross. Lord, I thank you that uh, you are revealing more to me and more to everybody here who's watching on how good you are. And, and Father, I pray that, that because I know that signs and wonders always follow the teaching of Jesus or the preaching of Jesus. And that's my heart's cry for everybody here under the sound of my voice, that that signs and wonders will follow, that whether you need uh, the breakthrough in the area of fertility or you need healing in your body, in your marriage, even in your finances, your business, then I pray, Father, that your goodness will shine forth, that, that signs and wonders will follow. And Father, I also ask that you will remind us uh, continually that when it comes to a breakthrough, it's thank you, Jesus, that it's not by our might, nor by our power, but by your spirit. So I thank you for that, Father. Amen. Well, I look forward to today's message. And today I am going to be sharing with you on Hannah's Prayer. Uh, I began last uh, time that I shared with you, I uh, shared a message on does God close the womb and I really encourage you to to watch that uh, message, it's on my YouTube channel, um, actually I think I've got a link here, it's, oh, it's probably a little bit small for you to read there, um, but if you're interested in uh, following me past these, uh, my Facebook page, I've got Instagram, I've also got my YouTube channel there. I think if you just Google my name, um, put that there, it should come up for you. So does God close the womb? I really recommend you watch that uh, with uh, this message I'm sharing today because that was really the uh, background or the foundation um, that uh, I'm going to be sharing on further today. Um, And I really felt to share on Hannah's Prayer for quite a while now. And I believe this is a a great message and I hope that it's going to be a, a blessing to you. So this is it today is Johanna's prayer and it's going to be on um, this whole account you can find in Samuel 1, 1 to verses 1 to 26. So I encourage you to read that in your own time. Um, generally, uh, what I normally do when I share, I sh- read out the whole passage and then I'll break it down. But just due to time, I'm just going to read it as I go. So I really do recommend that you just read this in one block. Um, to see uh, this for yourself. I believe context is always the key. Um, I think this one is is pretty easy and self-explanatory, but um, that will help you moving forward. So if you can just, um, if you're watching this on uh, the recording on the YouTube, just pause this, read that uh, whole passage, and then uh, come back to this teaching. So I generally, I uh, teach from the New King James unless I note otherwise. So that's the version I just default to. Um, I, I find there's other versions I like too, but I just find that's just my go-to. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be sharing on Hannah's prayer. And there we go. I hope you can see me there. I put that, um, my picture in picture there. I just find that when you're watching a YouTube video and you're just looking at a screen, um, you can kind of sort of just get focused on the screen. I'm just hoping with me having me here that... Um, It'll just make it a little bit more personal for you. And i just got to try to stop talking with my hands because that's what I do. <laughs> so you'll be ready. We're going to share today on Hannah's journey. And we know that Hannah is the mother of Samuel. Um, I've heard many different messages on Hannah's prayer. And so I pray what I share today will be a real blessing and will help you in your journey. Now, if you are not uh, wanting a breakthrough in the area of children, um, I pray that what I share today will just help you and bless you in the area of general healing. Uh, That you will see just as we unfold this uh, passage today and just all the little gems that I'm bringing out that uh, it will show you probably a little bit further how to rightly divide scripture and um, how to to look for something deeper than what you read on the surface. So let's begin. So the first part of this is Samuel 1 and I'm going to be beginning by reading verses 1 to 5 with you and it says, So now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerohoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of 
Zuf, and I really bad at Hebrew pronunciation, and, and it says he was an Ephraimite, and we're going to cover that bit a little bit later. And he had two wives. The names of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at in Shiloh. And that's what they had to do, uh, every um, Israel, uh, Israelite man, Hebrew male, had to go once a year to the, the temple. In this case, it was a tabernacle still. Um, the temple hadn't been built yet, um, which was located in Shiloh. And then it says, also the two sons of Eli, Hophini and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah although the Lord had closed her womb. Okay, so I will cover that because I do believe that's really important that we uh, do cover that, uh, did the Lord close her womb? And I once again, I refer to my message, which is up on my YouTube channel, entitled, Does God Close the Womb? Question mark. And so it was a 90-minute message. There's a whole lot of foundational teaching in there. So please, uh, after this message, go and read that and to get a bit of a further understanding of what I'm sharing very briefly with you today on this part of this scripture. So it says twice. It says here and straight after that the Lord closed her womb. But as you can see in my little subtitle there on my uh, PowerPoint is please do not take this literally. And this is the problem the church has had uh, not just so on this verse, but many verses. Um, I know I am a very literal person. I've had to unlearn um, not to take things too literally. Um, let me just say that, yes, we take the Bible literally. Um, there's some issues that are black and white, but not everything is meant to be taken literal. There, sometimes there's figures of speech at play or something else that is happening. I do cover that in my other message on did the Lord close the womb, so I don't have time to go through that today but I want to give you enough to get you excited to be able to, to be open-minded to be able to go and dig a bit deeper but just generally speaking where any argument that we use uh, especially from the Old Testament and there's even some difficult passages in the New Testament but they're mainly in the Old Testament and so any passage that we use that to try and establish and or say that hey God closes wombs God's in control of everything that happens um, that he causes suffering, um, anything like that, we need to bring all of that into the light of the New Testament and through the person of Jesus. Okay, we always, the reason why we need to, to do that is because Jesus, as Hebrews 1 3 says, he was the express image of the Father, the exact representation of his person, another translation says. So you look to Jesus, he says, you know, you, because I think it was Tom, Thomas, someone said, uh, you know, show us the Father. And the disciples said that. And he said, what do you mean, show me the Father? He said, I and the Father are one. He said, at least, at least believe in the miracles and, and the works that I do. We're one and the same. Also in John 1 verse 18, it, it, he's, John says that no one has ever seen the Father but Jesus. And if you look at the different translations and the Amplified says, it says Jesus has disclosed or unveiled him, revealed him as he really is. You know, nobody had a full understanding of who the Father was except through Jesus. So Jesus was only ever always good. He never made anybody sick. Um, he did the opposite. He delivered people and healed people from sickness and disease. So that's why I always say, let's look to Jesus because the Father and the Son are one. And we know God does not change. Uh, he does not alter his word. He cannot break his promises. If you'd like a bit more information on that point about the Father and the Son and God not changing, because uh, um, God does not change. It's not that he cannot, uh, which is what the message, my message was, God cannot change. Um, the fact is God does not change. Cannot means that he can, but he chooses not to. God does not change. He does not lie. He does not prove false. He does not break his word he does not alter his covenant or break his covenant 
Okay, there's a few other things that we shared in that message. That's another 90 minute message. Um, so that's already three hours that you need to look at to get a deeper understanding of what I'm sharing today on Hannah's prayer. Okay, so just going back um, to my notes here. So whenever we read through the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, we've got to filter what we read through um, the through filter it through the New Covenant, through Jesus' finished work. And pull back and look at the Bible as a whole to really look at the context. Uh, the other thing we need to consider is the culture at the time, the, their manners and customs, um, their covenant, what covenant they were under, whether they're actually obeying that covenant or living under it or not. Um, that's important um, to consider. Also to see if there were any figures of speech at play. So to look at was the language literal or was it figurative? Um Things like that. So there's, um, and also the big thing I think is what was their worldview of God at that time? Um, Israel as a whole or the person as a whole, just to get a bit of an understanding of how they viewed God and how they approached God. And all of these things really do make a difference to what we read in the Bible because with that understanding, you can then understand why they said what they said because they believed that, you know, they had a limited view of God. And so they uh, spoke that way, they acted that way. And so that's why we always need to look to Jesus. And while this is an amazing uh, account in the Bible of Hannah um, conceiving and having a son named Samuel, and it's a, a great um, story what I'm sharing on today, ultimately what I want you to do is, is to pull back and make sure you look at this in the framework of the whole Bible and don't put yourself in Hannah's shoes, but put yourself in the new covenant uh, under the finished work of the cross because how Hannah approached the Lord was completely different to how we approach him today. So we need to consider that as well. See, the Bible ultimately is uh, a, like we can sometimes look at it and we put ourselves in it. And it's not wrong in and of itself, but we just need to be mindful um, and careful when we do that. So before we start applying things literally and applying it to our circumstances today we've got to consider all of those factors okay so the bible was written ultimately it was written all about jesus and ultimately it's god's plan of redemption for mankind so you've got to pull back and look at the bible from the beginning to the end read it in context and know that it's god's plan of redemption for mankind and ultimately it's about one nation which was israel and then coming through like one or two families we've got the the priestly line which is the levites the line or the tribe of judah then we come through through one man jesus who was the savior of all mankind hebrews 10 says he says the volume of the book was written about me and here i am i've come to do your will oh god and then it talks about how he's set aside the first covenant to establish the second our new covenant and so through what he did on the finished work of the cross that's what we now live under so keep that in mind my friends so i need to stop myself because i've already shared on this i've done uh, god cannot change also did does god close the womb and covered a bit of that in there too so let's continue to move forward okay so this is just some of the context now looking at um, Hannah's world view and where she was situated within this story um, her and Panana and Elkanah and just even Israel as a whole now 1 Samuel chapter 3 so this is after Hannah has conceived Samuel she's had Samuel she's weaned him um, they it would have been three to four years uh, and before she um, conceived um, Samuel and then weaned him and then gave him and handed him to Eli in that tabernacle so this is 1 Samuel 3 after she had done that and uh, it says now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the law was rare in those days and there was no widespread revelation okay so th this is after he's born like this is three or four years after the fact maybe a little bit more okay so going back to Hannah's journey and you know add nine months of a con pregnancy conception and however long it took before there um, they, they were limited in their understanding of God so just looking at a bit of the the culture and what was happening is that um, keep that in mind now the message translation says of this verse this was at a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen 
Okay, so Israel was not living how they were meant to. She lived, Hannah and Elkanah, Penina, they lived at the time of the judges. Uh, we know this is before Israel had a king. Samuel was very um, instrumental in Israel's history. Um, he was the one who um, uh, anointed Saul for ministry as king and then King David. Um, so he was a, a prophet, um, and we know he was a prophet, and he was an amazing man of God and was so important to Israel's history. But, but before that, that really, you had Eli who was the high priest, and then he had two wicked sons, Hophini and Phinehas. Um, and, and if you keep reading Samuel, you'll read about how wicked they were. And so Israel was living like, really, they were not really living how they should be. Uh, under that Mosaic law of the Mosaic covenant, okay? So in, in Israel's history, at that time, they were made up of a loose, as you can see from my notes here, a loose collection of tribes and peoples, and they were living and worshipping in their own way, okay? So they weren't really following the Mosaic law. They weren't really following God truly by their hearts. We don't know how much idolatry and all that stuff was happening, but it was there. It existed all throughout Israel's history. Um, so just keep that in mind because that will give you a bit of an understanding. So when it says here, there was no widespread revelation, it really does mean it was they were limited in their knowledge and their understanding of God. You know, they were just living, however. Um, so it, like I used to think that everybody in the Old Testament had this amazing relationship with God, that they saw God, that God was really real to them. Um, they had a personal relationship and I used to be envious. I used to think, gee, I wish I lived in those times. I really wish that I could have been with these people and see what they saw. But when you really look at it and study it, they don't have anything over what we have. What we have is a far better covenant based on better promises they didn't have the general person did not have a relationship with god remember only the priest the prophet or the king um had that ministry of the holy spirit with them or upon them and, and not all of them had it always saul um, was very limited king saul the first saul was limited in that um so under the new covenant remember we have that better covenant based on better promises every single believer has been sealed with the very holy spirit himself who's the spirit of jesus the spirit of god's son paul said who has been shed abroad in our hearts and he also says that by that spirit we cry out abba daddy father okay so remember that where we are now so hannah didn't have generally a personal relationship like we do today and that's why we always need to remind ourselves which side of the cross we're on which covenant we're under and just remind ourselves god you are good and we've got that finished work and um so yeah so when we look at hannah we've got something far greater than what she had back then but it's still encouraging to to look at her journey Hosea 4 6 love this um the in the um new king james it just says god says my people perish because they lack knowledge the word knowledge is a very intimate word and uh, and it means knowing knowing personally by mutual participation and that's why i've put the new living translation because it does translate the meaning for meaning the king james and the new king james generally translates um the bible word for word uh, new living message amplified translates meaning for meaning and that's why I like to look at some things in a couple of different translations. So it says, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. I mean, this is in Isaiah's time. This is way after Hannah's time. But it stood true for her. They, they perished, they suffered because they did not know him. Proverbs 29, 18 in the Amplified Bible says, where there's no vision, and the vi that's not about you making a vision and casting a vision, right? As I've been taught in <laughs> church in Vision Sundays. Um, the vision is no redemptive revelation of God. And redemption is all about what Jesus has done for us. And redemption is about, in the old covenant, was God redeeming Israel um, from their circumstances, from their enemies, from their situation. Okay, so, so without a redemptive revelation, knowing that God is healer, provider, deliverer, etc., etc., then it says the people perish. The message says if people can't see what God is doing, so they don't have that redemptive revelation, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Um, I was going to share, I took it out of this message, that there are seven redemptive titles of God. There's ten in whole. 
where God revealed himself to um, the people in the Old Testament, um, just a different part of his nature and character as Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, the names of um, the redemptive titles, like you've got Jehovah Shalom, which is the Lord my peace, which we'll go through a little bit later. We know Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider, Je Jehovah Sidkenu, which is the Lord my righteousness, um, Nisi, the Lord my banner or victory, Rohi, the Lord my shepherd, and I can't lost count because I just didn't start. But there's seven in total. They're all awesome. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present or there. Jehovah Rapha or Rafika, which is the Lord my healer or physician. And I think I've got those. So they are the seven redemptive titles of God as he, um, uh, the, actually as the people had a need and they cry out to God, he would reveal himself, that part of, of his nature and character to them. But no one in the Old Testament had a full understanding of all seven. It's only through Jesus that we get that big picture. And for us today, looking back, we can see that. Now, number seven is important. Number seven in um, Bible numer numerology, I think that's the right termination for that, um, terminology, sorry. Seven is God's plan of redemption for mankind. Uh, it's to do with Jesus and his finished work. It does mean completion, um, but re seven is redemption, and that's where God has done all the work for us. Remember when Adam and Eve in the garden, on the seventh day, God rested. Then number 10, this is just a really brief thing, so as we move forward, number 10 in the Bible means total completion. It's talking about what we have through salvation, total, complete in every area of life. So that's number 10. Another number that we may need to consider for this, especially this message, number five. Whenever you see the number five in scripture and you can see five in play, five is the number of grace. Now, grace, I will go through that a little bit later, but grace is, again, about God doing all the work. It's a free uh, free action of God. Uh, it's unmerited favor, which means that we cannot earn it. Um, it's, so it's not about what we do, uh, anything by what we do. It's all about what God freely does because of his great love. Uh, for mankind okay so that's important we understand five seven and ten so redemption re revelation of god if we don't understand jesus and his finished work even under the new covenant we can really miss um what is freely available to us if we don't fully know and that's why i want to encourage you to to renew your mind and to remind yourself of which covenant you're under so you can stick with jesus and his finished work so just to, I'm going to have to hurry here because I will. <laughs> I'm going to run out of time. I'm still on that question, does God close the womb, right? Okay, so infertility is not from God. We know that he created mankind to be fruitful. And I did cover that in this the message I shared recently on does God close the womb, question mark. Okay, but here is one covenant promise that Israel had. Hannah was a, a part of Israel's history. It was after the Mosaic law was given. Leviticus 26 9 God says I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers and I will keep my covenant with you children were a gift a blessing and a reward from God okay uh, that's one thing that we need to continually remind ourselves of he created us to be fruitful at the beginning in creation after he created the earth and everything in it he then created man because he needed someone to care for and tend to the earth it was the earth was made for Adam and Eve for mankind because um, in Genesis 1:26 uh, says that God um, that he created man in his image and in his likeness and then he said he blessed them and said to them go forth be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the birds of the air the fish of the sea over every living thing and it says and over all the earth okay so God created Adam and Eve, mankind, to be fruitful. So if God was literally closing the womb, God was taking back or blocking or something, uh, which was a very big part of his creation. And also we know there was a fall, that death entered through sin, through what Adam and Eve did. But God had set up a covenant and uh, God revealed himself as Redeemer, 
um, to be able to help people to focus on him, even though there was that fall. So here in this scripture here, Leviticus 26, 9, which, which is just one of many that were given to Israel to show that I will make you fruitful. That fruitfulness is still a part of my plan, as God would be saying. You know, I will keep that covenant with you. So here, if, if God was making Hannah barren, if he was blocking or stopping or even, you know, allowing it to happen, uh, he would still be breaking his word, altering his covenant and taking back or stopping, blocking or delaying what he'd already done. I cover that point in detail in does, uh, that God cannot change. So please watch that message for a bit more understanding on that point there. Okay, so know that infertility is not from God. Look at this. The Bible knowledge commentary says on this verse that, that God closed Hannah's womb. It says, because a Hebrew man's posterity was bound up in his having a son to perpetuate his name, his wife's inability to conceive a son was regarded as a curse from God. According to Deuteronomy 7, 13 to 14, having children was a sign of God's blessing. Conversely, the Israelites considered the inability to bear children as a curse. Okay, so that's why they wrote that God closed the womb. They believe that God closed the womb. But it is a, a figure of speech here. There's other figures of speech within the Bible. One is um, known as, which I'm not going to go through today, but it's known as an idiom of permission. So when you see throughout the Bible where it says God sent, God struck, God smote, God hardened even, um, you know, and different things like that, that they are meant to be taken in a permissive, not a causative sense. E.W. Bullinger wrote on that, Robert Young in his analytical concordance, um, section 70b at the beginning of his old analytical concordance to the whole Bible. Um, he writes on that as well, that active verbs were used um, as a, a Hebrew manner of, of speaking and expression um, that, that God did it, but it's not to be taken li um, literal. It's permissive. But when you understand the permissive will of God, it's not that he stands back and goes, yep, whatever happens, happens, or even, yep, go for it, Satan, go and attack my kids, which has been a great misunderstanding from the book of Job, I might add, but I'm not going to cover that today. Um, the, the, it's not that God is passively allowing it, but because God gave Adam and Eve authority over this earth, to rule, to reign and have dominion, that when he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God couldn't step in and take that back because the free will was given. God cannot break his word. He cannot alter his promises. So he can't just step in and control. That's not how God functions or operates. That's not from the foundation of love. Okay, so that's important to understand. I do cover that in uh, a few of my messages. I covered that recently in a new series we started in our church entitled, Is God in Control uh, of Everything That Happens in Our Lives? I think I've called it, Is God in Control? Question mark. And so we haven't put that second message where I go into detail on that point, but that's important we understand. Next year, we will be going through, God willing, on the book of Job, and we will be breaking that one down as well for you um, that has been one of the most misunderstood books in the bible and it's unfortunate because that's where most believers get their doctrines on who the father is but once again let's look to jesus and his finished work just in short if anybody says what about job here's my reply but what about jesus okay we are not in job and we're not in adam we're in Jesus, okay? We have Jesus and his finished work. That is my answer. That is my response. And that's who I look to of how God functions in my life today. So I pray that will bless you if you've been wondering that one as well. So infertility, that please don't take where it says does that God closed her womb. Please do not take that literal. So you will need to watch those other messages to get a deeper understanding on that. But the bottom line was this was um, the people at that time. This is what they believed at that time. So, yes, that's why they said this. So remember to stick to your new covenant. Also, uh, further on that, the teacher's commentary says, In ancient Israel, children were more than important. They were symbols of fulfillment. In Hannah's case, her childlessness was a double burden. And then it's in verse 6, which we're about to read about Penina. It says, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Not a very nice woman, Penina. 
Okay, so again, in ancient Israel, children were more than important. It doesn't go through it there uh, in great detail. I had other resources I wanted to share, but it would just be, this message would be too long. But children were a, an inheritance um, because uh, children, not only were they, um, if you had children, they would be involved in the family business and they would help you. Uh, but as you got old, your children would look after you. Uh, today, the family unit is breaking down, unfortunately. And so we've got to work hard and save hard because we live in this fallen world uh, to prepare for our retirement. Um, so, but in Israel's time, they didn't have social security. They didn't have bank accounts or things like that. So their children would look after them in their old age. Uh, so their children were a blessing on many other levels as well. So, and of course, anybody that here that is watching this who is struggling to have children, you know how important uh, children are, not just for those reasons. It is what God created us for. It's a desire of our heart. It's what he created a couple for. He's created us to reproduce uh, mankind. So we know how painful that can be when that is, um, there's complications there. Okay, so... Again, so when we, just to finish on this point, I think I have finished on this point. I've got to remember what I've got on. Next on my message is that, um, that God didn't literally close Hannah's womb. So keep all of this in mind. So let's continue on this passage. So now from verses 6 to 7, it says, you know, and, the, and her rival also provoked her, provoked her which was Penina, remember. He, she provoked her severely to make her miserable. So you can see her heart intent here was to make Hannah miserable. This is Hannah, the other wife of Elkanah, uh, because the Lord closed her womb. We've already covered that. I don't want to go into that. So verse 7, so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord. Because remember, it, once a year, they all had to go uh, to the tabernacle um, that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. So Penina was fruitful. It says that uh, Elkanah and Hannah, we read in the earlier verses, that he would take Penina and her sons and her daughters. Her children aren't even mentioned, uh, but we don't. So we don't know how many she had, but we know because it was plural. She had a, a few. So she had all these kids. So Hannah would have had to watch um, the conception, the birth, the you know the raising of these kids year after year. It says. Year by year, she went up to the house of the Lord and Penina would make her miserable. She would taunt her and flaunt her fruitfulness in poor Hannah's face. Okay, so what I've shared here with you today is I just want to encourage you to not let anyone become a Penina to you. Um, it's not just people, but sometimes I, I know myself in my own journey, you know, when you're told you can't have children or even if you're just struggling to have children. For those who are watching today that, that uh, don't need a breakthrough in that area, but maybe you need a breakthrough in healing. Um, maybe you need, uh, you're believing God for financial breakthrough for it to p purchase a home of your own or a business or um, you're struggling in the area of relationships or general healing. It's very easy where, to just be in that position of lack where you see yourself in lack and that can especially happen when you look at others who have what you're believing for. Uh, it can be very painful. But even I found that just in my journey, it's wherever I looked, there was pregnant women. I mean, even the TV commercials. I mean, I watch pay TV most of the time now, so there's no ads generally. But all the television commercials on baby nappies and formula and children. And, and I found it initially so painful. To watch. I mean, I also belong to a very, very fruitful church. Um, that it, the first of every month they had baby dedications. So all these lovely families with their happy little babies and happy little families get on the stage. And I used to find it so painful because it's like, oh, you know, because I would focus on um, my journey, and of course, I would put me in a position of lack. And so that just got exacerbated. You know, wherever you go, that can be the case. Um, if you belong to a fruitful family, that can be very difficult as well. Your friends, your friend circle, um, when they start conceiving and have babies and, and you're not, you know, that can be very difficult as well. But let me encourage you here, don't let anyone or anything become like that penina to you. Okay, and remind you of your lack. Um, because it's when you do focus on it, and let's, let's face it, it is real. What we go through is real. I'm not telling you to deny your circumstances or your diagnosis or anything like that. But that where I just want to encourage you to come to a place where you can connect 
with Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, to be able to help you when you face things like that, just to help you in your journey, to remind you, hang on, um, that, that he is more than enough, that while you're currently experiencing lack, that he is your provision for every area and that he is more than ready, willing and able to show himself strong to you in your time of need. So I want to help you in that journey because sometimes I've said in my notes here, it's like a thorn in our side sometimes, you know, and a, a thorn in your flesh or a thorn in your side is a figure of speech. It's not literal. It's not a sickness and disease that infertility is like a thorn literally in your flesh. Um, I actually have a message on that. I posted it up earlier in the year. Oh my goodness. It was at a conference I did. Um, healing by grace I think it was by healing by grace I think and I covered Paul's thorn how that's a figure of speech and it was always referring to a people group okay so the Israelites are warned to wipe out certain nations or to be careful of certain nations because they'd be pricks in their eyes or thorns in their sides pricks in their eyes because they would see them worshipping the idols and they'd be tempted to do the same or thorns in their sides or pricks in their sides because these people groups would be antagonistic towards them they you know they were they were going to harass them they were going to persecute them and that's what penina really represents here um just you know fights not against flesh and blood anybody that's like a penina who's deliberate in their actions you know what god bless them jesus i leave them in your hands you just focus on your journey uh, I think the worst thing we can do is ever to compare ourselves to somebody else. We're all on a different journey. Our circumstances are different. Our diagnosis is different. How we relate to God um, sometimes and our understanding of him can be different. So keep your eyes off other people and just fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of your faith. He is enough for you. I know that's difficult, but I really pray that that, that part there that I just shared will really encourage and bless you in your journey. Just another point I wanted to make here now is on two wives, okay? So it says that Elkanah had two wives, Penina and Hannah, and it tells us Hannah was barren and Penina had children. She had sons and daughters. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says on this, and there's other commentaries that say something similar. Okay, it says... Elkanah was a Levite by lineage, but an Ephraimite by residence. Just want to stop there. There's a few that actually say that because remember when we read in the beginning verses 1 to 2, I think it was, it says that Elkanah was an Ephraimite. And um, some of the other commentaries on that verse go through and say, no, he wasn't. He lived in Ephraim, but he was a Le Levite by lineage. And that's Im important to understand when we look at this story, and you'll see why in a second. Okay, so he lived in Ephraim. Um, see, all the tribes of Israel weren't in their, their proper groups and their proper places. They were all scattered everywhere doing their own thing. And it says here, one indication of how lawless were the times in which Samuel was born. Can we see that? And see, this is looking at the culture and the understanding of the people of God and where were they, they were at at this time. So I'll read that again. One indication of how lawless were the times in which Samuel was born is his father's bigamous marriages. Often in those days, though it was never sanctioned by God, a man whose wife was infertile would take a second wife by whom he would bear children. And then he gives you some examples. This explains why Elkanah had two wives and why Hannah, which was his beloved or would have been his first wife, was the barren one. And so why she fervently desired a son. And other commentaries will say this as well, that Hannah would have been the love marriage um, she would have been the one he loved and so because she wasn't having children it would have been quite probably quite a few years that that's why he chose another wife Penina and so that's why year after year they'd go to that temple and and poor Hannah had to watch that other wife you know she was a beloved wife and here's this other wife come in who's conceiving having babies left right and center and so year after year this was a massive painful journey for her okay understandably so um, but it was never sanctioned by God for him to have two wives. This was part of the culture and what the people did generally. Israel did it. Um, we see all throughout that they did it. Um, we see Abraham, who was, um, I suppose, he was the first Israelite. The, the her he was the father, wasn't he? Um, but he was a pagan, okay? God spoke to him and called him out of his country from his father's idolatry and house and made a promise to him. 
But understand that Abraham's background, he was pagan. He wasn't, a, a, a if you understand, a Jew or Hebrew. Um, he became one and he, as he became to learn to trust God through his journey. And we'll go through Abraham at another message another time. But just consider that and remember that, you know. But he took, remember Hagar, not as a wife, but as the maidservant. You see his son, you know, um, with um, Jacob, uh, with Leah and uh, Rachel, how they bought their, I mean, that was a different double marriage thing there. That was, he was tricked by his father-in-law Laban. But they, as you watch the journey as, as Israel, the nations of Israel came about with the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, with Jacob and Leah and, and Rebecca, that they brought their maidservants to him. That wasn't sanctioned by God. That's what the culture did at the time to to because children were so important to them. Okay, so it happened. It wasn't necessarily something God said to do. They did it and it was allowed because we have a free will. You know, God can't stop and break that free will. But God used that regardless, didn't he? Because that th those 12 sons from Jacob became the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so going back to this message, so that's why Elkanah had Penina. And it can really just show how painful Hannah's journey must have been just to witness that. Okay, let's go back. There we go. I think I had... No, that was all I had on that one. So then the next verse here in verse 8 so then says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her... Hang on, I think I missed something. Let's go back. Yeah, there we go. Nope, I'm right. I'm right. I thought I missed something there. So verse 8, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? I mean, I just want to smack him. <laughs> and why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? I mean, you can see his compassion and his concern. I mean, he had children, and not by Hannah, but um, so you can, you know, he, he's probably a little bit satisfied there. But um, you can see, um, you know, his love and his concern to see her so upset. He's trying to encourage her. Um, but, you know... And, and, and sometimes it can be really difficult when others say that to us. You know, why are you so upset? You know, you look at all the things you have and you just go, I just want to smack you. <laughs> like it's really not helpful at the time, you know. And, and especially when you are, you're stuck in your circumstances. And, and while people love us and they're wanting to help us, we may not always see that. And I, just don't judge people unless they've walked in your shoes. They have no idea uh, what it feels like and, and what those comments uh, are really saying to us, you know. Um, so I always go, God, they're ignorant. They don't know. Um, just bless them. <laughs> Help me just to get past what they've said, you know. <laughs> but here, what I wanted to focus on, and I just wanted to bring this out. It doesn't really add to the story per se and the revelation of what I'm going to share. But I think it's interesting because he says, am I not better to you than ten sons? This is actually a figure of speech. Because remember, what, do you remember when I said what number 10 represented? Total completion. Okay, so when he's saying, am I not better to you than 10 sons? 10 is significant there. He's saying, Hannah, uh, don't I complete you? Aren't I enough for you? That's what he's saying. So I wanted to share that with you just to show you that how um, there's so many figures of speech and like we just read this literally and go, that's nice he said that, you know, he's wanting to encourage her that he's better than 10 sons, but there's something deeper at play here. So I pray that blesses you whenever you see the number 10 and 7 and 5, that just look a little bit deeper and look at some richness you can pull out of that passage. So it's a figure of speech. And don't I complete you? Am I not enough for you? He's saying to her. And just in case you think that it's something I made up, Will Wilmington's Bible Handbook says, Elkanah tried in vain to remind Hannah how special their relationship was, asking, you have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? And that's in verse 8, as we know. And this is like the number 7, which Will Wilmington's Bible Handbook did cover this. Uh, the number 10 showed completion or special emphasis. Okay, so again, I just wanted to share and cover that little part of Wilmington's there for you to show you that it's not just me, there's other resources that share that as well. So verse 8, let's continue. And this is verses 9 to 11, and it says, So Hannah arose after they'd finished eating and drinking. Uh, we know she didn't eat because it says she didn't eat. So after everyone, because it was part of that, um, what they were doing at that celebration in Israel at that time. Uh, after they'd e e finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, 
Um, and what was interesting, if you actually look at Israel's history, is that they did have drink and food and drink, and it was a celebration. So when Eli saw um, Hannah and saw that thought she was intoxicated, um, uh, there's there was a bit of a reason for that as well. So just, that, uh, that's just an interesting side thing. But let's go back to the text. So Hannah arose after they'd finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And you can understand why, especially those that have experienced um, infertility or loss. Then verse 11, then it says, Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Okay, I just want to cover verse 11. And then we're going to, we're going to cover a little bit later the, the um, Eli sitting by that doorpost. Um, and we're also going to cover, O Lord of hosts, how she cries out to the Lord of hosts. We'll cover that in a second. But here, the point I wanted to make here and what I wanted to draw your attention to on verse 11, that she made a vow. Now, I was taught um, a crazy whole lot of different things, but this was a part of uh, Israel's um, culture. It was under their law. So the vow of dedicating the firstborn, um, that was a part of their law. That was uh, established after, if you remember, Egypt. Remember with Egypt how all the firstborn were protected um, at Passover with the blood that was sprinkled on the, the doorposts and the windows of the lintels and that spirit of death passed over. So the children of Israel's um, firstborn children were saved and protected whereas all the Egyptians um, children and animals and livestock died um, that so it was known from that point on was that the firstborn would be dedicated to God so they would do that anyway as a general thing um, so that was a given but also this vow that she made with where she says no razor will come upon his head this is not something that she made up this was part of what was known as a Nazarite um, a vow uh, we saw, we see this in, it's in Judges uh, 13, 2 to 5. Remember um, Manoah and his wife that gave birth to um, Samson. Um, they were under similar circumstances that they were also struggling to have children. Um, and so they made that same vow when they dedicated him to the Lord. Okay, so if you want to get a bit of a background of those vows and just a little bit further study doesn't necessarily add to this story, but um, just if you wanted the further study, numbers six, one to eight, and numbers thirty-two to fifteen. So um, I just thought it was interesting to include this. That this wasn't something that Hannah made up. This was part of um, what Israel would do anyway. So that vow that she made as the Nazarite vow, um, there were laws and rules that went with that under the Mosaic law. But if you actually look at um, uh, Samuel's lineage, he would have ended up in God's service anyway, okay? Um, and here in, uh, regarding this vow, and I've just picked a little portion of this and it, it's a little bit interesting to read. So, Jameson Fawcett Brown in his commentary of critical and explanatory on the whole Bible, oh my goodness, especially old, old books have really long um, convoluted titles, <laughs> And it says the circumstances of his birth, Samuel's bound him to this. Um, to and it, I'll share what that this is in a second. But his residence within the precincts of the sanctuary would have to commence at an earlier age than usual, in consequence of this Nazarite vow. Okay, so I didn't want to include everything else because it was quite big and detailed to get the full context. But remember I shared uh, earlier in Wilmington's uh, handbook that Elkanah was a Levite. Remember the tribe of Levi? What were they? They were in the priestly line. They were meant to be officiating at the altar and the tabernacle. I don't think that was fully happening. So Samuel being a Levite was meant to be a part of officiating at the altar anyway. But because of this Nazarite vow, it meant that he was meant to be dedicated um, for that service a whole lot sooner. So as soon as he was weaned, um, that was the general rule for that, and that was three to four years. Um, so that's what Hannah and Elkanah did when they had Samuel. That's really interesting to note, isn't it? So it, it um, I just pray that what I'm sharing, just the little nuggets here will be... Uh, 
a real blessing to you. Uh, and just sort of help you to, as you look further, just to dig deeper in what you read just for further study. I love how the Bible comes to life as you dig a bit deeper and not just look at literal words. Okay, the other thing I wanted to, to refer to here where she cried out to the Lord of hosts. Um, God had actually revealed himself to Israel as Jehovah or Yahweh, which was a covenant keeping God. And whenever you see Jehovah or Yahweh mentioned, the Redeemer of Israel, it is a personal covenant name where God redeems Israel. And I just thought it was really interesting that she called him Lord Almighty. Uh, Lord Almighty is a translation, another translation, or Lord of Hosts. Um, that is part of the ten uh, Jehovah titles, but it's one of the greater ones. And but it was also a Lord of Hosts or Lord Almighty was also used um, generally outside um, as well in Israel. The Tyndale Concise Bible Commentary says here of this term of Lord of Hosts or a Lord Almighty is a military designation referring to God as the one who commands the armies of Israel and the angelic armies of heaven. Uh, also says um, that Hebrew, ex this was a Hebrew expression, so they use this as an expression as well, found frequently in the Old Testament and literally meaning army or army of the skies or hosts, army of hosts. And it's basically a military term occurring over 500 times in the Old Testament. Okay, so I just think this is interesting to note because she's crying out to the Lord of hosts. But God had revealed himself. And when you see when he reveals himself to people as Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah, um, it is that covenant keeping God. But she's not crying out to the covenant keeping God. She's crying out to the, hey, God uh, upstairs, God of armies, God of hosts. And while God is... And that is a very powerful name and who he is as Lord of Hosts is very powerful. It doesn't represent the personal one-on-one -on -one redemptive relationship. So she shows further that she didn't have a deep revelation of understanding. She wasn't crying out to Jehovah or Yahweh, even though it's referring to the Lord throughout this um, passage. So you see Lord in capitals is referring to Yahweh or Jehovah. Jehovah. Um, so it's referring to that, but she didn't call or upon her covenant seeking God she wasn't calling upon him as part of that covenant that he made that I'll make you fruitful as we shared in Leviticus 26 9 and you know um, Exodus 23 25 to 26 he said you know if you worship me I'll bless your food and water I'll take sickness from among you and none or miscarrying will be barren in your land and I'll give you a full lifespan so there's several scriptures that were under that mosaic law that she could have called upon hey um, Jehovah or Yahweh, you're a redeemer. This is what you've said to me in this covenant. But no, she's crying out to the Lord of hosts, which is equivalent to the, hey, God, if you're there, the God upstairs, please answer my prayer. Um, so it's still, she's praying from the heart, but it just reveals there wasn't that personal relationship. But after she had Samuel and she does this prayer and this dance and this song, um, she says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Okay, covenant keeping, that's Yahweh, Jehovah, or Jehovah. Um, I rejoices in him, the covenant keeping God. My horn is exalted. Horn means strength. It was also a dress, part of the dress that women would wear. Um, so it was a figurative language that, so horn does represent your strength. In this case, the strength to conceive seed. Um, it's exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. I rejoice in your healing, your redemption, your deliverance. You delivered me from barrenness. I rejoice in who you are. Now, just be careful when you read the rest of that because she says some things that aren't really true about the nature and character of God. She ascribes everything to good, God, both good and evil. And that's why we need to pull back and understand the Bible as a whole and everything else that I've shared with you to know how to rightly divide what she prays at the end there. But I think that's important to note that, that you know, who was this speaking to or about and why, what was their covenant, uh, what was their worldview of God at the time. So as we look at some of these things, we can see where they were situated in their um, journey. But let's keep reading. So then, so with all that said, you know, then Hannah goes and uh, we'll pick this up in verses 12 to 16. And it says, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord. So she'd gone and she'd made this vow. Um, so she was praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Remember, he was sitting at the doorpost of the tabernacle. Okay, um, now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, 
but her voice was not heard. So Eli had no idea what she was saying, okay? He could just see her lips moving. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? So here he is thinking she's left the festivities outside where Israel is eating and drinking and having a celebration. She's wandered off from her family. Remember, women weren't considered as much, especially on her own. So she is probably thinking she's a wayward woman. What's she doing being drunk? She's up to no good. She's probably a loose woman, probably a prostitute maybe. I don't know. Um, and so he's like, you know, what's this woman doing here near the tabernacle? Okay, and he says, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor, t uh, not, uh, drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Okay, now what's really interesting here is that Eli had no idea what she was praying about. Okay, he just thought she was drunk. She was saying, no, 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 I'm not drunk. I've got a deep cry in my heart. I'm in grief and I'm just praying and crying out to the Lord. Another thing to note here, because uh, I've heard many ma very interesting um, messages and teachers teaching and preaching on this subject. Um, that says now Hannah was in the church, so you need to be in the church. And Hannah, went, you know, she was there every Sunday, so you need to be there every Sunday. You, you, you'd be shocked at some of the things I've heard of this message. Um, she was not in church. Um, she wasn't even in the tab tabernacle. Women couldn't go, or the general population, population could not even go inside. All you could get to was at the, the front where you would present, and it was the male that would present the sacrifice to the priest who would then go in and do and officiate and do everything else. As a woman, she was even further restricted of where she could go. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, but she was there, she'd gone. Uh, that's where we know where they knew that where the presence of God would dwell in the Holy of Holies. So, you know, God, if that's where you are, I'm going to go because that's probably where you hear me. Um, and so she was crying out to God. And then that's when Eli at first thought she was drunk. But then she said, no, 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 I'm just a sorrowful spirit. I'm at grief here. I'm crying out to God. Okay. It's interesting, isn't it, to look a bit of it background. Then Eli answered and said, or responded and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And that's the King James translation. Okay, so, okay, great. You're not drunk. You're sorrowful of spirit. You've got a deep anguish here. So go in peace and may God grant your petition is how Eli responded. Remember, he didn't know what she was praying for because that wasn't here. Voice was not heard. All he knew was that she had a deep cry of her heart. Okay, because sometimes we think, you know, that some the other person that's praying for us has to know every single detail uh, of what we're going through and why we're going through because they need to be specific how they pray. Uh, otherwise, it might not get answered and all these other things. And that really doesn't matter. Okay, <laughs> um, I think we can get hung up all, on all of that. God knows the cry of your heart. And when you connect with him, he already knows. Um so when you ask someone to pray for you, yep, there's nothing wrong with sharing what you're going through and why. That, that's not my point. Uh, but we don't have to, okay? If you feel you've got a private journey and you think, like, I really don't, you know, because we feel like we've got to confess everything and tell everything. Sometimes it's like, you know, I've got a marriage issue here. Can you just uphold me in prayer and just pray for wisdom for me? That, that can be enough. You don't always have to share everything. Even in your journey, uh, if you want people to pray for you, they don't have to know that you're struggling to have kids if you feel you're not safe with that person praying for you. So just keep that in mind. Okay, but here, go in peace, Eli says. This was not just a nice greeting. This was so powerful. Okay, Eli was the high priest at the time. He was also a judge over Israel. And so for him to say this, he was God's representative to the Israelites. Okay, wasn't a very good one. I'm just going to say that. He let his wicked sons get away with a lot. Uh, so he wasn't a perfect man, but he was still God's representative. So that was um, Hannah's version of a, a type of Jesus, if you like, um, the high priest and the judge. Um, that had said to her, go in peace. And he blessed her. He pronounced that blessing on her and he had the authority to do so. So go in peace is powerful. P 
Peace in Hebrew is the word shalom and means, and you know, when you title together, and I'll go through what the dictionary of biblical languages says of this word peace, but it means uh, in a nutshell, to be complete, to be sound in your welfare, physically, emotionally, every part. So it's your whole in every area. So I've just cut and pasted this out of the dictionary of biblical languages with semantic domains of the Hebrew Old Testament. Don't you love these titles of these old books? And it says of this word shalom. This is the definition of shalom. It can mean peace or prosperity, being prosperous, an intact state of favorable circumstance, completeness, um, i.e. the state of totality of a collection, safeness, safetyness, sorry, salvation, a state of being free from danger, health, look at this, a state of lack of disease uh, and of wholeness and well-being, satisfaction, contentment, okay, being satiated, full, complete, not missing anything, the state of having one's basic needs met or more uh, being met, Sorry, uh, the state of having one's basic needs or more being met and so being content. Um, also can mean a friend, companion, one who has an association with another with affection or regard. Also means a blessing, the content of the act of giving kindness to another. And um, Then Yahweh Shalom there in Hebrew, which means translated as Yahweh or Jehovah is peace. He is Shalom. And uh, it was also the name of the altar with uh, uh, Gideon or Gideon or, yeah, I think it was Gideon, Judges 6.24 or Samson. You'll have to look at that. Don't quote me. Um, and then uh, we know Jesus himself is the Prince of Peace. It's one of the names of the Messiah, uh, which is referred to in Isaiah 9 verse 5. So can you see this word shalom when Eli said go in peace? He's saying go in wholeness. He's pronouncing wholeness, a state of lack of no disease, of wholeness of well-being as I've bolded there, of total fulfillment, entering into a state, you know, of being complete. In other words, he's saying go be healthy and whole. Whatever the need, may you be whole in every area. As he pronounced as the, the high priest and the judge, um, in Hannah's culture and at that time. Isn't that beautiful? But that's why we need to look at our new covenant and which side of the cross we are on because Jesus is our Prince of Peace. So as you see throughout the Bible, just as Eli pronounced that blessing and said, go in peace, Jesus did that. And these are two accounts. One is in Luke 7, 49 to 50, where to the woman, remember, I think it was Mary, was it, that broke the alabaster jar um, of perfume over Jesus' feet. And he said to her when she did that, he said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And, and uh, the Greek and Hebrew equivalent, go be healthy and whole. And here it's referring to your faith has saved you. Uh, salvation uh, or saved sozo in Greek, salvation soteria in the Greek is that word there. And it basically means the same thing. It's being having that physical as well as the spiritual. To have the complete forgiveness of your sins and to be saved in every area. To possess eternal life and everything else that Jesus finished and perfected for us. So that was one account in uh, Luke 7, which referred to the forgiveness of her sins and the salvation, eternal salvation for her. And remember with the woman with the issue of blood. And that's in Luke 8, uh, verse 48. Remember the woman with the issue of blood that had had that condition for several years. She went up and touched Jesus, the cloak of his garment, and she was instantly healed. And then Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? Because he knew someone had drawn from him. A woman should have been anywhere near Jesus. And um, she probably would have been in fear at first going, oh my goodness, I've broken so many rules here. Um, not only was she unclean, but, you know, she was a woman. She shouldn't have been there. And he looked at her, Jesus looked and said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Same blessing. Go, be healthy, be whole. It covers every single area. I just want to whiz through the rest of this message here. So if, uh, I encourage you, watch this on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. You can pause it and read some of my notes. Okay, so now you, my friend, you can go in peace. Okay, now Hannah met the high priest, okay, 
of her time, which was Eli, and he declared, and he said, Go in peace, behold. We have Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. We now have his finished work. And, and really, Hannah's breakthrough, this is the point of Hannah's breakthrough, where she connected with the high priest, okay? Where she connected, there was a, a connection that was made there. Um, and, and I just, I've got a note here on my PowerPoint, is that sometimes... Um, when we look at this, because like she went to, you know, and this is what I've heard, um, you're struggling, you need to be in church because Hannah was in church, Hannah prayed, Hannah was nice to her pastor or priest or whatever, you know, yes, we need to do those things, but uh, let's not twist scripture, um, okay, so, you, you know, I've heard it all, um, so, but we can be looking for a person or a point of contact and while there are gifts uh, within the new covenant, there's the ministry gifts, the spiritual gifts, um, etc., is that remind yourself of your new covenant. The very same spirit that anointed Jesus is now the very same spirit that now lives and dwells in you. It is the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who dwells and lives in you. That's why Jesus said it's beneficial that I leave this earth, that I can send that comforter, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, that you can do what I do and greater. Okay, you have him. And so I know what it's like. And, you know, sometimes we can't find someone to agree with us or to pray with us. But I also wanted to share, you don't need to find a priest or a pastor or a leader or a ministry, even me, my ministry, to pray, someone to agree or pray with you. You have Jesus. You have his very spirit. You have more than enough. Yes, they're ministry gifts and they are for the body. Um, I'm not taking away from that. But I want to encourage you. Uh, in your relationship and in your journey with the Lord so that you can uh, concentrate on your relationship, that you can learn to go to him directly. Um, yes, uh, at times we need people, that's okay. I'm not, don't feel condemned if you feel you need that. But I want to encourage you to extend yourself beyond that and to connect and know you can connect with him for yourself. I mean, if you need an instant breakthrough somewhere, I had a girlfriend who was miscarrying. She'd had three miscarriages in a row. She was diagnosed with lupus, with antibodies in her body. She was told she could never carry a baby to term. And here she is. She was pregnant. She started to bleed heavily, just like her previous miscarriages. And uh, she called me. She called my other girlfriend. Um, I was on my ministry team, Gillian and everybody else and she could not get onto any of us and she was just thinking i need someone to come into agreement with me her husband was away in business so she couldn't get onto him um and so she was really distressed and fearful and then just that still small voice it was like hello <laughs> it was like jesus reminding her you don't need a man or a woman or a ministry or anyone else i'm with you agree with me join with me and I will help you and she did and the bleeding stopped and that little girl finished high school last year just completed her first year of uni miracle baby in every way incredible that journey and that story okay so I just want to encourage you you might be in a, a place where you feel you have no one to connect with um, there's no one that you know you don't need them it's nice it's an added bonus but you can go to Jesus for yourself, okay? That's my point, and I want to pray that blesses you. So then let's continue verse 18. So we get down a little bit, and then, so Eli said, go in peace, and may God, the God of Israel, grant you your petition. And then Hannah said, uh, let thine handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no longer sad. Why? Because she had connected with that high priest. She knew something had taken place, that she'd been heard, that there was a response there. She knew that within herself. And that's why she was like, that's it. I know it's done. Um, and she was able to go and eat and, um, and just get past that natural circumstances. When you've had that point of contact, whether it's a revelation of God's word or just an inner knowing or inner peace about your the prayer that you're believing for, whether it's children or any other healing or other area, I find that does put you in that place of rest because you know you've heard from God, you know that you have that answer. Now, your circumstances may not change initially, may even get worse if you're believing for physical healing. I had times where things got worse. 
Uh, but that inner rest was then able to help me to be able to go, hang on a second, I'm going to look past my circumstances. I'm not going to deny them. I know they're there. I know they're real. They're obvious. But I'm not going to focus on them. I'm not going to allow them to dictate my peace, my happiness, or my future. I'm just going to, you know, find a place of rest where I can draw from the Prince of Peace to have that wholeness flowing, just even peace of mind as well. Okay, so when, and also here when Hannah said, let's, uh, uh, let me find grace in your sight. Uh, I don't believe Hannah had a full understanding of what she was uh, declaring there. But for us, Jesus, grace is um, God's unmerited favor, but essentially grace is a person, it's Jesus. It's uh, God's unmerited favor, it's a gift, you can, and it's un, um, it's undeserved favor or merit in the way of it means that you cannot earn it by what you do. Grace is something that is bestowed on you because of God's love for you. You cannot earn it. You cannot work for it. It's not based on your performance. It's based on God's goodness. And that's why I love our new covenant because our new covenant is all by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says we're saved by grace through faith, which means through believing in Jesus. It's a gift of God and not of work, so none of us can boast. Okay? So by grace, by God's unmerited favor, none of us deserve it. But it also means that none of us can earn it by what we do. It's not based on our performance. It's based on Jesus' performance because our covenant was made between God and himself, God and his son. And faith, as I mentioned, means believing in Jesus. We're trusting and resting in Jesus' performance and not our own. It's a faith covenant. And when you focus on Jesus' performance and you're walking with him, everything else seems to fall into place as far as performance goes but when you concentrate on your performance and what you do what you don't do you get stuck in your own ability and it's almost like putting yourself back under the mosaic law a performance based system okay which is not based on grace it's based on you keeping all the laws and all the commands of the law whereas our new covenant is based on us putting our faith and trust in who jesus is and what he has done for us now, righteousness, our right standing with God is a free gift all by God's grace. The reason why you can lay hold of healing and everything else you need for your breakthrough is because of grace, because of God, what he freely provided for us through Jesus. Amen. Paul said, while we were still sinners, God sent Jesus to die for us. And while we were out strength, okay, he died for us. Why? Because he loved us. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. The Father came down as the Son to provide a way out from what happens to us while we live in this fallen world. So I just wanted to touch on that verse in verse 18 there. But again, let's uh, go back to verse 9. Remember how I said that uh, um, how Hannah arose after they'd been finished eating and drinking in Shiloh and then she'd gone to the outside of that tabernacle where Eli was sitting by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. Uh, the manners and customs of the Bible says of this passage here. It says, In some parts of the ancient Middle East, a seat was placed in the courtyard where the master of the house sat and gave judgment on all the domestic affairs. Okay, so this is in generally speaking in ancient uh, Middle East. So not necessarily with Israel, but everybody within that culture and surrounding. This is what would happen. The, the master of the house, the father, the head, of the household would be there so any disputes or anything like that would be brought to them and they would make the judgments okay we know Eli was a priest he was also a judge over Israel so let's continue on manners and customs of the Bible so they were so that seat there was a seat placed in the courtyard where the master of the house sat and gave a judgment on all domestic affairs this seat was usually placed in some shady part of the court against a wall or column Thus, in the text, Eli was sitting on a chair by the doorpost, and that's why it says that. And it says also that David sat by a seat of the wall in 1 Samuel 20, 25. Uh, these seats probably had no backs and were therefore placed near a post or a wall for support because they were backless. And it says, thus, we are told that Eli fell backwards from his seat uh, uh, at the gate and died. And that's in 1 Samuel 14 when he heard that his sons had been killed in battle. Remember, um, you can read that in your own time, but they had taken the Ark of the Covenant when I think it was the Philistines... Um, uh, it would come to attack Israel and they didn't even inquire the Lord. They took that ark, not how they were meant to, into battle and the ark was captured and they were killed. And when Eli heard on that, he fell back 
and uh, he died as a result, probably would have hit his head, something would have happened there, and he died of, as a result. Uh, and then it also says the Assyrian monuments have many representations of such backless seats. So that was the part of the culture, but this is what Eli would do. He'd sit on the doorpost, we read here, of the tabernacle of the Lord. And so once again, we can see that um, Hannah wasn't inside, she was outside where the women were allowed to attend, and he would have seen her and noticed her on her own. And uh, seeing that she was mumbling or uttering and not being able to hear her, uh, just seeing her mouth, that's why he thought she was drunk. But he was a judge uh, for Israel, sitting there on uh, also what was known as a judgment seat as well. Okay, so when we see that Eli, when he judged after the flesh, he judged Hannah by what he saw in the natural. Uh, no discernment there at all. Okay, so for a man that was meant to represent Israel, there was no connection here that he went, okay, God, what is this woman doing here? He just judged her after the flesh, um, which, which is what? man does generally and even under the law we get judged according to our flesh and our performance and what we can do what we can't do our natural circumstances our diagnosis all that stuff but then when he connected with hannah and hannah said no my lord i'm not drunk i'm just of bitterness of soul i'm at grief here and i'm just crying out to god so then he judged her rightly and he said go be healthy and whole and what God really pointed out to me that Eli, the the it was a high priest as well as the judge, he judged her condition. Hannah knew what she was believing for then. He didn't necessarily, but that condition was judged. Okay, and he said, okay, whatever your prayer is, may God grant that. Go be healthy and whole. Okay, I uh, just wanted to draw that out there. He judged as that high priest her condition. And what do we have there as judge and high priest? We have Jesus. And now for us under the new covenant, he officiates at the heavenly altar for us through his one time eternal sacrifice. His blood continually cries out on our behalf. And it doesn't just cry out, not guilty, not guilty. Um, it cries out, you are my child, you are redeemed, um, you're blessed, you're loved, you're approved, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, not by what you do because you're not under the Mosaic law, but by what I have done because I am your high priest, I am your sacrifice, I am your redemption, I am your saviour, amen? So we can look to Jesus and our finished work for us today. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, which were with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is of this, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption literally means the forgiveness of sins, the eternal forgiveness of sins. You can read that in uh, Ephesians 2, 7 and Colossians 1, 14, um, uh, part B of that, and especially the Amplified Bible. And um, there's other verses as well that say that. But not only do we have eternal forgiveness of sins through Jesus' one time uh, sacrifice, because it's eternal as well. Um, that we have been redeemed in every area of life. Okay, barrenness was judged. Sickness and disease was judged on that cross on our behalf. Jesus did not only pay the price for sin and the forgiveness of sin, but for every area. So at the same time, in the same manner that he took our sin to the cross, he took all the consequences or manifestations of sin, which was sickness and disease and everything else that entered this world through the fall in the garden of Eden and in short and I, I love this because I had a massive revelation of this so you hear me say this a lot that Jesus was the last Adam that came and redeemed mankind from everything that that first Adam brought upon us we are no longer dead in Adam if you're a believer you are alive in Jesus he is your representative now Hannah's not your representative, Anna's, um, Adam's not re your representative, even Abraham is not your representative. Jesus is your high priest, he is your representative. If you're a believer, you are in him, you are joint heirs with him, you are seated with him. 
Amen. Can you see now why we need to continue to look whatever we read, bring it into our covenant? Where's our position? Where do we now stand in this? Okay. So another thing I wanted to cover in verses 19 to 20 here. So we'll continue and it says, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. So this is after Eli said, Go be healthy and whole. And she said, Let me find grace in your sight. Um, and and uh, off they go. So they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. New is an idiom for intercourse. Okay, um, relations and the Lord remembered her, which I want to cover in a second. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. So Samuel means asked of God or heard from God. Uh, one or the other there you can you can look that up and um, google and you'll find that probably even a little bit deeper meanings of all those names there as well okay so there i just wanted to cover god remembered her because i just want to share that god does not forget you he does not forget his own children wilmington's bible handbook says of this passage um, as in Genesis 8.1 and Exodus 2.24, the Hebrew word sometimes translated as remember, which is in the King James and the NIV, does not mean to recall or call to mind, okay, but rather to pay a special attention to. And he says Paul used the corresponding Greek verb in a similar way when he talked about remembering the poor in Galatians 2.10. So being to, like look after or, I mean, a bit when it comes to the poor there, um, you know, let's, let's pay, pay special attention to them. And so my point and why I wanted to share this, so when it says God remembered, it doesn't mean that God forgot. It doesn't mean he forgot his covenant, what he had promised to the children of Israel, that I will make, my, my, make you fruitful and I'll bless you and I'll keep my covenant with you. God had not forgotten that, okay? Um, but so remembered doesn't literally mean that God forgotten. It was like, oh, that's right, there's Hannah. Oh, yep, I remember you. It's not like that. Okay, so it just means paid special attention to. E.W. Bullinger also says this. He said, it's a figure of speech which is anthropopathia. I think you pronounce that. My Greek speaking friends can probably correct me on that pronunciation. Anthropopathia. <laughs> uh, this figure, uh, it is, and I've broken it down very simply. This figure of speech is used of when, through the description of human passions, actions, uh, or attributes to God. In E.W. Bullinger's book, Figures of Speech Used in, in the Bible, there's a whole massive write-up on this. And so when you see in the Bible things such as the hand of God, the eyes of God, the mouth of God, um, even when it talks about the emotions of God, so not just the physical, his eyes, his hands, his mouth, uh, which people take very literally, um, it is a figure of speech. It's where we ascribe human uh, uh, attributes, um, passions, actions, um, or desires to God. It's figurative language, okay? There's something deeper that's being conveyed there. We are so literal, and, and I think if we understand that not everything is meant to be literal. Um, so the hand of God is talking about, it's also a, another figure of speech can be used as a metonymy of the subject. So God's hand is placed in, as something else. Um, that's another message for another day. I may go through that as if I do this Bible online Bible school, I'll go through some of those figures of speech. So you see things like the, like I mentioned, the eyes of God, the hands of God, um, even the emotions of God, like God remembered, God visited. Um, also, um, even the wrath of God, believe it or not, there's a big section there um, that where we've attributed uh, human emotions and feelings to God. Um, and so we take that literal it is referring to something str quite strong, but we just be careful. When, just know that when there is a figure of speech, um, it's important we understand to draw back and look at what is the point that's being made here. And also look at who is writing this. What was their view of God? What was their understanding of God? Let's look to Jesus. Does this view of God line up to with how we know who Jesus is, what he revealed under that new covenant? So that's a really exciting thing. And, and I found a web page that actually covered this. And it said, this actually lets God off the hook for some of the things that we blame him for, this figure of speech. So again, going back to my message where it says, God remembered it is an anthropopathia <laughs> figure of speech, not to be taken literally that God forgot then remembered, but he paid attention. And then he says, Samuel's name means um, name of God or heard of God. This was the name Hannah gave to him. 
That doesn't mean that God that hears or answers. There's another figure of speech. He said it's a hypocatastasis, um, which was an implication. So there's a, I, I don't really want to spend too much time on this. But because we just read this literally, we get this idea that if I just pray right, if I just connect right, if I just do something right, then God's going to remember me, then he's going to hear me, or then he's going to pay special attention to me. Uh, okay, and so under the new covenant, uh, we'll, we'll go through what we already have in Jesus in a second. So this is why there's so many different things that talk to us about how to pray or laws of prayer and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then we get stuck on what we pray, how we pray. Are we using the right words? Are we, you know, saying the right things? We're we getting someone in agreement. There's so many things and it gets so confusing. And I just want to draw you to Jesus, my friends, because he is more than enough for you. What you have through him already. Amen. And just so this to to conclude on this point here, God remembering. Uh, remember uh, Romans 11, 29 and the Amplified and the Message versions, which uh, say this beautifully and that tra their translations but in the new king james it says all of god's callings or gifts are irrevocable um i think the amplified says without repentance which means without changing his mind which means his gifts once he gives them he cannot take them back when he gave adam and eve fruitfulness he cannot take it back because he cannot alter his word he cannot break his covenant he's a kingdom of fruitfulness and a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand so god does not making someone barren and sick and then healing them it's not how his kingdom works at all we covered that very uh, briefly and i did cover actually i think i did labor on that in my message god cannot change which is on my youtube channel if you want further information on that point and also remember in Acts 10.34, Romans 2.11, um, where the Bible tells us God does not show partiality or favoritism. Okay, so it's not like, okay, Hannah, there's a special blessing on point, upon you because you prayed right or you did something right. It's not how the kingdom works. Okay, you can see that. You can feel like that. Um, so God is not running out of babies. Okay, it's not how it works. Uh, some Jews, Jew or Hebrews, believe that there are all souls in heaven that get come and put down into earthly bodies. The Bible's um, a little bit silent on that. I think that's been added. I haven't studied that out to agree or disagree with that, but um, I'm not sure. I do agree. I'm not sure, but uh, it's not like God has all these babies or souls in heaven that He's dropping them down. I don't. I'm not sure. I actually. Uh, believe that once again so i haven't studied that out so don't quote me on that okay so but remember infertility and the reason why people couldn't conceive was there was a sickness a disease or a complication i've been reading up on uh, different bible commentaries and bible dictionaries on childlessness barrenness and children and uh, uh, quite a few of them say um, that, that they especially in the old testament in ancient Hebrew especially, they had no idea of the conception process. They knew it came from the man, but they didn't know about the egg and the conception. They believed it's something that happened in some far off secret place. Um, that God was literally at work doing it. Um, there's a lot of poetic language uh, of scriptures with that as well. Um, but we read and take these things literally. But we know that God created in the garden, Adam and Eve, their reproductive systems and everything that they needed to go forth, be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them with that fruitfulness and said that to them. Okay, and so we were created to procreate. That was created at creation. Even though there's a fall, that still takes place today. Okay, animals still reproduce. The trees of the, the field, um, the herbs, shrubs continue to reproduce today from that original garden and the earth that God created at that time. So everything is still continuing to procreate. So if you're not procreating, if you're unable to conceive or carry a healthy baby to the full term of your pregnancy, it is because there's some sort of complication, a sickness, a disease, or a complication. It is not that God has forgot you. It's not that God has uh, run out of babies. It's not that he hasn't heard your prayer. There's something else at play. Okay, we live in a fallen world with fallen people. That's really the main reason why we struggle and suffer today. The world is fallen. Sickness and disease can happen to any of us. But when we look to Jesus and his finished work, we know he provided answers for all forms of sickness and disease. Amen. 
So we need to look to that further. Now, uh, continuing, uh, this is in 1 Samuel 2, 18, because um, we just read that ha uh, Elkanah knew Hannah. That word knew is the same word for we get knowledge. Remember I shared in Hosea 4, 6, where it says, my people perish because they lack knowledge. Uh, the New Living Translation says, because they don't know me. Elkanah knew Hannah. That's a very intimate word. I'm not talking about in relationship with God, I'm not talking about carnal knowledge there. I'm talking about spirit to spirit, that we can connect and know him personally. Okay, but Elkanah knew Hannah. She conceived, gave birth to Samuel. And then after that weaning period was over, which would have been around three to four years, most commentaries will tell you that was the weaning period uh, for Hebrew women uh, in that culture at that time. And then so she dedicates Samuel, as she promised, for, uh, due to that Nazarite vow. It was a lot earlier. It was after he was weaned. And then look at this in verses 18 to 21 in chapter 2. It says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman. Amen. Not from Benina, from Hannah, from this woman. Okay, for the loan that she had was that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And then it just says, Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Three plus two, what does that equal? Five. What's number five? It represents God's grace. God's ability, a free, undeserved, unmerited gift. I think that's so significant of God's grace overshadowing her and her having three sons and two daughters. Uh, I love that portion of that scripture. Okay, remember her point of breakthrough was when she really connected with that type and shadow, very loose type and shadow of the judge and high priest to her at that time um, is where that she got that breakthrough, but ultimately it was not based on anything she did. It was based on God's goodness and his grace. Okay, because there's so much, you know, um, I've heard so many messages sound great, but anything that's going to put an emphasis on you and what you do, how you pray, beware, my friend, because then it takes a focus off Jesus and who he is and what he has done. And you put your focus on you and who you are, your circumstances, your lack, what you can and cannot do. If your breakthrough is going to be dependent on you and what you do, good luck. Because uh, you're going to have to keep that up. You have to be perfect. You can't drop the ball on it. Okay, as we do, because we're human. So there have been many messages, some good, not, some not so good. Um, I remember hearing a message uh, saying that, you know, Hannah was in the temple, which was in the church. You need to be in the church. You need to give. You need to do this. You need to do that. You also need to pray a prayer like Hannah. You need to dedicate your child to God. That child is not your child. Um, you know, also you have to be at the point of misery, um, at sorrowful in spirit. You have to be uh, repentant. You name it, I've heard it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, Samuel, the conception of Samuel and Hannah having five more children was dependent on God's goodness and his grace and not dependent on Hannah, on how she prayed and what she did. Okay, remember our salvation, we are saved by grace, which is God, God not just unmerited favor, but by God doing that work for us. He sent Jesus, he did all the work, the finished work through his son, on our behalf that is unmerited unearned undeserved our covenant was made between God and himself how we enter and become beneficiary beneficiaries my friends is when we believe in Jesus <laughs> it's based on his performance and not ours it's not about the way you pray it's not about you being repentant or not repentant you know I don't want to cover that um, and go into a deeper message of that but it's not based on your performance it's based on Jesus' performance. We're under a faith covenant. Put your faith in Jesus. If you're walking by the Spirit, if you're putting your faith in Jesus, your performance does eventually take care of itself. If you've got that relationship you're hearing and you're responding, he will never lead you astray. So you can trust him in that area. Okay, so this Hannah's victory was not based upon her prayer, 
by what she did. It wasn't based upon her cry. She met with that high priest. There was a point of connection. He said, go, be healthy, be whole. And the rest was history. He was like a very loose type and shadow of Jesus to Israel at that time. But for you and me today, we have something far greater than what Hannah had at, in her time. James 4 to 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And it doesn't mean that God is distant or has left god is always there he lives in us my friends by his indwelling spirit we draw away we get so hung up on our life our circumstances that we forget that he's in us and with us always so as we draw near to him uh, it, it, that's just a figurative language he'll draw near to you but he's there all along what jesus has done is still standing firm for you and his finished work is there for you um, so you can connect with him anywhere anytime not based on your performance okay please be encouraged by that but based on jesus performance you may feel that hang on i've messed up in my life we've all messed up in our life some we may consider worse than others but as far as god is concerned sin is sin okay we categorize it and say well this is probably a white lies bit better than a full-on blown lie but that's not sin is sin we've all fallen short of the glory of god romans 3 says Paul tells us that but, that, but the very next verse, he says, but we've been justified freely by his grace. We have redemption through what Jesus provided for us, that he is bigger than anything that we have done in our past, that Jesus is more than enough. Focus on his performance and what he did for you on your behalf. Look to him. He is the author and the perfecter of your faith. And faith means to trust and rest in him and not in yourself. Uh, if you're looking at your past, or you're looking at your mess ups, your slip ups, then my friend, you've left the cross. If you approach God based on your weakness and your past performance or your sin, your actions, you are not in faith. We don't realize that. We're approaching God based on our own merit and our own behavior and going, God, you know, here I am. But he's not going to look at that. That does not please him. The only thing that pleases him is faith in his son. He doesn't want you to approach him based on your performance your own performance whether good or bad is like filthy rags he wants you to base him on based on faith thank you father for what your son did for me that because of jesus i can freely approach your your the, the throne room of grace with freedom and confidence hebrews says because of what jesus has done for me and the book of hebrews is written to the hebrews not all had accepted jesus sacrifice we are covenant children his spirit lives in us we are seated with him in heavenly places already because we have faith in jesus so remember that my friends okay so it's not like god leaves you um god is with you always and I pray that this message on Hannah's prayer will bless you. It's not about her prayer. It, it, her, the way she prayed, it's not about what she did. The only thing she did besides actually going and seeking God and, and crying out to him, there was that connection with Eli, the high priest. Um, that The only other thing she did was she had relations. She knew her husband, okay? She had relations, marital relations with, I don't want this to be X-rated, but I think you get my point, uh, with her husband, okay? Um, and so the breakthrough came by God's grace and favor. So let that be an encouragement to you today. And uh, there's so much more I could share on this. I actually have an audio message on this. It's about a 90 minute message uh, called um, Hannah's Victory, where I go a little bit into a bit more detail. That's on Nerida. Let me see if I've got Yep, under that first one there, narratorwalker.cartloom.com. You'll find that there. I did have a website with all of this plus heaps more information, but it got that website got hacked. I had a blog. I had over a million views on the blog. The whole thing got um, hacked and deleted, and we just haven't restored it. Um, so I'm really thinking, do I do it again? Do I start again? Or what do we do there? So um, I just pray that today has been a blessing to you, and I just want to remind you again, Jesus is your representative. He's paid the price from whatever is preventing you from going forth, being fruitful and multiplying. Jesus is his judge baroness through what he did on the cross. He judged everything that we did on our past, that we have an awesome future in him. So look to him. We have the finished work of Jesus. Um, actually, there was one other thing I wanted to draw here um, is to know, I'm going... There we go. 
um, oh, there was one other page I had there. There we go. So focus on the solution is the other thing I wanted to say. I nearly cut out of this way too soon and I'm really going to have to finish this message for you, my friends, is that, so this wasn't um, about Hannah. Sometimes we look to these stories in the Bible. We look to Hannah or we look to Abraham and Sarah and we put ourselves in their shoes and we're trying to find answers through their suffering. We look to what they did, um, how they did it and the rest. But that's not the point. I've already covered it was by God's grace that she conceived and got victory. Okay, always look to the end from the beginning. You'll always find some sort of point of contact where they met with a type of Jesus or an angel appeared or something uh, for them for their breakthrough. We already have that through our relationship with Jesus and his finished work. Okay, so don't focus on Hannah's prayer. Don't focus on her barren condition, her cry of a heart. She wasn't barren. If we look back on Hannah's journey, why do we always focus on the beginning? She was a joyful mother of six children in the end there. One she dedicated to the Lord, but she had five more children as we saw. Okay, God is good. We know that barrenness was never his plan or purpose for our lives. And Jesus has redeemed us from everything that happened from the fall. I, I'm not going to cover the rest of this uh, PowerPoint, so you'll need to pause it to read my notes on that one. But again, just on closing, Jesus is enough. Remember your new covenant. What Jesus did on that cross is not the, at the same time I've covered this, in the same, at the same time, in the same way and the same manner that Jesus provided the eternal forgiveness of your sins is where he redeemed you from everything else that came in through that fall. He bore on his body, Isaiah 53, 4 to 5 says, he carried our griefs, he bore our sorrows, um, or the, yep, yeah, or, yep. Yeah, which is our sicknesses and our diseases, and by his wounds or stripes we are healed, or in Peter it says were healed. Jesus paid the price for us, for all the sicknesses and diseases, those that are named, those that are not named. Remember, infertility and miscarriage is caused by some sort of sickness and disease or complication. Okay, bring it to that simplicity and know that Jesus has already covered that for you. He went ahead over 2,000 years ago before you were born and he provided the answer before you even had a problem. So what Jesus did on the cross, it's not a future tense promise. So that's why it's not about Hannah's prayer or about our prayer, how we pray, how we respond, how we, all that sort of stuff. Because God has already answered. He's already provided the answer to our baroness miscarriage prayers through what Jesus has done. What we're lacking now is revelation on that finished work and what he's done. And so therefore, through our relationship with God, let Him, uh, let us just come and stop striving to get this breakthrough and, or any other breakthrough we need. And let's learn to go to God through relationship and let him reveal himself to us. Remember, Jesus said of the Spirit, he is going to take from what is mine and he's going to reveal it and make it known to you. It's the role of the Spirit to reveal Jesus and his finished work to you. So don't try too hard on that one. Yes, we have the Bible. Yes, we have scriptures. But let the author of the word bring that to life to you. Okay, by his indwelling Spirit. Let him reveal peace in your heart regarding your breakthrough and your family. Let him quicken to you what to do, what not to do. Let him guide you and lead you. Okay, so it's a provision. It's not a future tense promise that you have to work for or earn. You cannot earn anything from God. It's based on a gift. Salvation, healing, and everything else is a gift of God. By grace, his provision, and through what Jesus has done, through faith, which means through us having believed in Jesus. You can't work for it. It's not based on your prayers or on your performance. So focus on Jesus because he is more than enough for you. And I said here at the end here, Jesus is our great high priest that has gone ahead of us. He's redeemed us already from barrenness and he has made us whole. So whatever breakthrough you need, whether you need healing in the area of fruitfulness or you have other healing in your body, relationships, finances, whatever, know that Jesus is the answer. He is more than enough for you. So I pray this has blessed you. Let me close in prayer and uh, we'll go from there, my friends. Father, I thank you for your goodness and I thank you for this amazing account in the Bible. 
that we can look and see that whoever, every godly couple that cried out to you, they got their breakthrough, they got their answer. And Father, I thank you that you've already seen ahead before we were born, that you provided Jesus as our answer for our healing of barrenness and miscarriage and unhealthy babies, unhealthy pregnancies, etc. and everything else we face in this world. Father, I ask that you'll take what I've shared today and that you'll make it known to those under the sound of my voice, that you'll bring it to life to them personally, that you will encourage them personally. And Father, show them that, that looking to you and having you is more than enough for the breakthrough they need. And with the authority that I have in Jesus, because his spirit lives in me and his spirit also lives in you, I command barrenness to be finished in your life today right now i command any condition in your body your partner's body that any complication that is sickness and disease that is preventing the conception and your fruitfulness of your children and for those that need fruitfulness in the work of your hands in businesses and finances i command that complication to cease and be removed right now with the authority that i have in my lord jesus and I speak life and I command life to function and to flow and health and wholeness to flow. And I declare with the authority in Jesus, go be healthy and whole, be fruitful and multiply in the fruit of the womb, in the work of your hands and everything you put your hand to. Amen. Amen. Amen.